This is Randy Shell, and I'm making a short podcast that is to be used uh, to review the foundational knowledge on acid base disorders prior to our flipped classroom interactive discussion. An overview of what we'll talk about today. First of all, the in training exam, American Board of Anesthesia keywords related to the topic. Uh, we will look at acid-based sample concepts, including uh, what's measured versus what's calculated, what's the effect of temperature on the arterial blood gas values, how do we tell the difference between a venous versus arterial specimen, and what does an air bubble in our arterial blood gas sample do to it. So let's look at the ABAIT keywords uh, first. Between 2009 and 2015, these are the keywords related to acid-based disorders. Under acidosis, you can see the first one, saline hyperchloremic acidosis, probably a question related to high volume saline resuscitation, lots of chloride resulting in this hyperchloremic uh, metabolic acidosis. You can see there's several questions on strong ion difference. We will cover that. Uh, that's the difference between the positive ions and the negative ions uh, that can be measured. And uh, one question on metabolic alkalosis, respiratory compensation, would be a uh, drop. Uh, if the bicarbonate is going up, then your PCO2 would have to go up also to compensate. Uh, miscellaneous cases in arterial blood gas, arterial blood gas opioid effect. Uh, so you have opioids on boards or have respiratory depression, CO2 will become elevated. Pulmonary embolism, salicylate toxicity with anion gap metabolic acidosis, the effect of hypoventilation in the recovery room, which would be hypercarbia, acute respiratory acidosis, temperature correction on the CO2, which in the case of hypothermia would result in a lower PaCO2 and hyperthermia with a higher PaCO2, um, and then COPD, which is classically associated with uh, CO2 retention with uh, metabolic compensation that is a rise in bicarbonate. So let's look at ABGE sampling uh, issues or concepts first. When you uh, send off an arterial blood gas, the pH and the PaCO2 or PCO2 if it was a venous specimen um, is actually measured versus bicarbonate which is calculated. Uh, if the patient's temperature is not 37 degrees like it is in the arterial blood gas machine, but then, if the patient's hypothermic, the molecules of oxygen and CO2 do not have as much kinetic energy, they don't bounce around as much and create the higher partial pressure, and cold actually decreases P low A CO2 and PaO2. And as the CO2 goes down, it's going to look more and more like a respiratory alkalosis as the patient gets cold. Because of this uh, temperature effect uh, being relatively acute, uh, it has little effect on, on bicarbonate. Hyperthermia, conversely, uh, the molecules have more kinetic energy, and so PaCO2 goes up, and the partial pressure of oxygen actually goes up. And because the CO2 is going up, you get a decrease in pH or acidosis. And this is shown uh, in uh, pictorial form on the bottom right of a decrease in temperature causing a decrease PaCO2 and PaO2 partial pressures. Now, a venous specimen, uh, what does it look like versus an arterial specimen? Well, once the blood has gone from the arterial system through the capillaries, well, you've used up more glucose, so you'd expect the glucose to be lower on the venous side. Uh, it's going through cold tissues, so it'd be colder. Uh, it's using up oxygen, so it's going to have lower oxygen content after the tissues. And the pH, because the CO2 is going to be higher, um, uh, pH is going to look more acidotic, or at least to have a lower pH by about 0.03. And the venous oxygen is going to be lower than an arterial oxygen. Uh, in fact, it tends to be, if the patient's on room air, in the 40 to 50 millimeter mercury range, as opposed to a normal arterial PaO2 from a healthy patient on room air of approximately 90 millimeters of mercury. The CO2 is higher in the arterial blood gas sample in a venous specimen by about six millimeters of mercury. Now if you have an air bubble in the sample, you've drawn it, you've left a bubble in a big one, just remember that that air bubble is mostly nitrogen and 
21% uh, oxygen and has little to no CO2 in it. If you remember, uh, one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, 21% of 760 is about 160 millimeters of mercury. So you can immediately determine that if the patient's P laleo 2 uh, uh, was drawn on room air and they normally should be about 90-ish, that bubble is going to have more oxygen in it and it's going to diffuse from the bubble into the blood sample raising the PaO2. Conversely, that bubble has very little, if any, CO2 in it and the patient's blood has CO2 in it. So it's going to diffuse from the patient's blood into the bubble and the patient's CO2 uh, will go down. So a bubble can have a effect uh, depending on what the patient's baseline PaO2 is and it can change CO2 also. So the traditional acid-base interpretation, uh, we get an arterial blood gas specimen and the pH and pCO2 are actually measured in the machine as pointed out earlier and the bicarbonate is calculated. We then look at the electrolytes, the sodium chloride and bicarbonate, which are also measured uh, from the electrolytes. Notice the bicarbonate from the electrolytes is measured as opposed to the bicarbonate from the arterial blood gas, which is calculated. We can then calculate an anion gap using uh, sodium as the major uh, cation and chloride and bicarbonate as the anion, and subtract those two out and see if there's an anion gap or not. And then we look at the history. Does the patient have COPD? Maybe they have respiratory acidosis with uh, metabolic compensation, metabolic alkalosis as a compensatory mechanism. Opioids can cause acute respiratory acidosis with an elevation in CO2, a big drop in pH. NG suction can remove chloride and hydrogen ion to result in metabolic uh, alkalosis. Tissue malperfusion can result in lactate production and acid and uh, cause an anion gap acidosis potentially. Diuretics can, can, can cause a contraction alkalosis and large volume saline resuscitation with all the chloride that's in it can cause a hypochloremic metabolic acidosis. So there's six primary acid-based disturbances, two respiratory, acute and chronic, um, acid out, acidosis, two uh, respiratory alkalosis, either acute or chronic, and then metabolic acidosis uh, or metabolic alkalosis, so six disturbances. Strong ion difference uh, refers to a, a non-traditional approach to interpreting arterial blood gases in which you look at the difference between the cations and major anions in the blood. And obviously there has to be electrical neutrality, so the difference between cations and anions in the blood, if you can measure all of them, should be zero. However, the major cations in the blood, sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium are all measured. You can see that up at the top with the star on the left side of the equation. And then we subtract from that the major uh, anions, that is, that we can measure, chloride, and sometimes uh, lactate is put in here. But you can see in the boxes on the bottom of the anion category, down at the bottom, there's unmeasured anions, uh, and we call this difference, SID, strong ion difference, uh, uh, when we subtract sodium plus potassium plus calcium plus magnesium minus chloride plus lactate, it's normally about 40. That's assuming that there's normal albumin levels. So just remember, a strong ion difference is normal about 40, and we can calculate an anion gap by going sodium plus potassium minus chloride uh, uh, and bicarbonate. Um, so strong anion difference, a concept that will be important, we'll discuss in our um, interactive classroom portion. Now anion gap in albumin is another concept that is important. Anion gap. Uh, is usually calculated sodium and leaving out the potassium portion of it with sodium minus chloride plus bicarbonate and normal is about 7 to 14 milliequivalents per liter. Um, interestingly, albumin uh, constitutes up to about 80% of the unmeasured anions. So if you have big changes in albumin, it can alter your um, uh, anion gap, and we can correct the anion gap for uh, serum albumin by this formula here that says your anion gap plus 2.5 times 4 minus your serum albumin. So let's say your serum albumin was only uh, 2, 
uh, 4 minus 2, very hypoalbuminemic, times 2 and a half, it's 5 on that side of the equation. You can see how the corrected anion gap would be higher, and hypoalbuminemia could um, make you not be able to pick up at an anion gap. So hypoalbuminemia decreases uh, the A total portion of the strong ion difference calculation. It increases the strong ion difference and is associated with metabolic alkalosis. And it can mask the detection of acidosis by unmeasured anions. So the take home message really is if you have a normal albumin, uh, the, uh, the um, worry about um, making compensatory calculations for your anion gap, etc., is not anything that you need to do. But if you have a very low albumin, you should make that a compensatory calculation and get a corrected anion gap, um, taking into account this hypoalbumin. Changing strong ion difference uh, explains some things. One, if you just realize that the body is normally in a slightly alkaline side of neutral state, and then if you concentrate that normal alkaline state, i.e. Uh, a patient has overzealous diuretic use, in the ICU we see it frequently, contraction, alkalosis. You basically are contracting the alkaline side uh, of, of the uh, patient, and increasing the strong ion difference. And this is called contraction alkalosis. Part number two here, um, if the sodium is normal and you have alterations and concentrations of other strong ions, they will affect the strong ion difference. For example, if you have a high chloride, um, high chloride causes an acidosis and actually decreases the strong ion difference. Remember from the equation, it's the cations minus the anions, with chloride being the major component of that. So if chloride goes up, such as in hyperchloremic resuscitation, where you're giving sodium chloride infusions, large volumes, 5 liters, 6 liters, 7 liters, 8 liters, whatever, remember that the chloride concentration is 154 milliequivalents per liter. That's way above what's in our normal uh, plasma and uh, you get a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis with a normal anion gap. As opposed to if we have a buildup of lactate or keto acid, such as in a diabetic ketoacidosis, um, you have these uh, metabolic acids that result in an anion gap. Um, because remember, anion gap was uh, calculated using mostly sodium chloride and bicarbonate. And so these unmeasured organic acids uh, are, should be contributing to the anion gap, but we don't measure those. So it's an uh, anion gap metabolic uh, acidosis. So three concepts here. One, if you overzealously diuretic uh, administer to a patient and they're very dehydrated, uh, dehydrated state can result in a contraction alkalosis. Two, if you give large volumes of saline to a patient, lots of chloride, you get a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, and the strong ion difference actually becomes less. If you have lots of keto acids uh, or lactate, you can get an anion gap metabolic acidosis. Acid-based disturbance is one method for uh, evaluating acid-based disturbance. One, you should ask the question, is the pH life-threatening? Do you need to do something immediately? Um, look at your electrolytes in your history and not just your arterial blood gas, but look at it in context. Ask the question, is the pH acidemic? Is the pH less than 7.35 or alkaline? pH greater than 7.45. And then look at the CO2. Could the entire arterial blood gas picture represent only an acute increase or decrease in PCO2? Can you explain it all, in other words, with just a CO2 change? For example, a change in PCO2 of 10 will make approximately a change of 0.08 in the opposite direction. 
Now, if the PCO2 cannot account for the entire arterial blood gas picture, that is a chain in the PCO2, then you have to say, is there a metabolic component? And compare the change in bicarbonate with the change in PCO2. Uh, and the change of bicarbonate PCO2 in opposite directions implies a mixed disorder. You should also calculate the anion gap, which was sodium minus the chloride plus bicarbonate, especially if there's an acidosis. So you can say, is this an anion gap acidosis or a non-anion gap acidosis? And if the patient's albumin is very low or very high, you need to make a correction for that when you calculate your anion gap. So looking at uh, disorders of acid base, up at the top you can see respiratory disorders, either acid, acidosis or alkalosis. Acidosis, respiratory, CO2 is up, and uh, over time the bicarbonate goes up to compensate. In the case of alkalosis, hyperventilating patient, uh, for example, the CO2 goes down and the bicarbonate will go down in a compensatory response. It was a simple disorder. In the case of metabolic acidosis, it's a problem with bicarbonate being low, and the PCO2 is going to go down in compensatory response. If there's a lot of bicarbonate around, metabolic alkalosis, the PCO2 is going to rise in response. The disturbance, response, and expected change is shown in the bottom graphic, and you can pause and look at that uh, if you desire to. Lastly, Acid-based disturbance is commonly seen perioperatively. If opioids are given in large doses, it's not uncommon to see respiratory acidosis acute in the recovery room uh, or in the ICU. If you have incomplete reversal of neuromuscular blockade, respiratory acidosis can occur, hypoventilation. Respiratory alkalosis in the holding area, you put in an arterial line and draw blood gas, and someone who's very anxious, they may have a very low uh, PaCO2 and acute respiratory acid occurring, alkalosis that is occurring. Metabolic acidosis, if you have hypoperfusion of the tissues, low cardiac output, low blood pressure, uh, metabolic acidosis can occur and a buildup of lactate over time. Uh, hypotonic fluid administration and hypochloremia, the classic large volume resuscitation with sodium chloride causing a hypochloremic metabolic acidosis. And then a metabolic alkalosis, uh, a massive blood transfusion, uh, the blood contains citrate, FFP contains citrate also by the way, that citrate is metabolized in the liver to bicarbonate if your liver is functioning normally, you're not cold uh, or anhepatic uh, in the case of a liver transplantation. So as you metabolize that citrate to bicarbonate, you can result in a metabolic alkalosis. NG suctioning, which removes chloride, and uh, hydrogen ion also can result in metabolic alkalosis. So these are some common perioperative acid-based disturbances. And uh, I'll see you in class on Thursday. Have a good one.